This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. Hey, this is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life, a show where I talk with some of the most creative writers, musicians, artists, entrepreneurs, and academics. In this episode, I'm talking with Sandy Gennaro, a rock drummer who's actually become a public speaker. And we cover a couple of things in this. One is the idea of calling your part in. We talk about tenacity and the role of tenacity has, and visualization, how that could be a tool for achieving your creative goals. Let's get into the show. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted to have our guest today, Sandy Gennaro. And Sandy is a Nashville-based drummer, speaker, teacher, and author who, over the last 50 years, has worked with some of the biggest names in rock and pop. These include Cindy Lauper, Joan Jett, Bo Diddley, Johnny Winter, Michael Bolton, Robin Gibb, and The Monkees. Since 2007, Gennaro has been a frequent counselor at David Fischoff's rock and roll fantasy camps, but you'd be wrong if you thought he came late to teaching. For 27 years, he taught drums at The Collective in New York City before moving to Nashville, where he still maintains a private teaching practice. Finally, as a public speaker, he has given motivational talks for FedEx, Belmont University Guitar Center, and Sam Ash. So, Sandy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me, James. I really, really appreciate this opportunity. So, share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, right now, um, uh, I just left the Pat Travers band and, um, I am embarking on, well, not embarking, I'm already established as a speaker (coughs) and, um, I'm still active, uh, recording and playing live here in Nashville. And, uh, I'm right now at the moment preparing for this Dick Wagner Memorial concert. Um, remember the children's, all the profits go to Remember the Children's Fund, and uh, that that is in Detroit on February 20th, and it's going to include uh, Brad Whitford uh, of Aerosmith, Derek St. Holmes of Ted Nugent's band, as well as uh, family and friends of uh, Dick Wagner from Detroit, uh, some members of Kid Rock's band, and so it's going to be like a an all-star show, and I'll, I'm in the core band, so we're p- busy right now at this moment rehearsing uh, for that. After I get done with that, um, we're going to be doing some dates with uh, Brad with the Whitford St. Holmes project, which is Brad Whitford of Aerosmith and Derek St. Holmes, the lead vocalist of Ted Nugent's band. And when they're off the road with those artists, they have a a project that they do together. And I'm going to be playing drums on. Uh, they just released a new record, and uh, I'm going to be doing the road the road thing with them starting in March. So there's, ex- there's some exciting things on the horizon as well. Uh, um, I'm going to be speaking at FedEx in Memphis, actually, this coming Wednesday, the day after tomorrow. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, get my speaking, corporate speaking, underway. I'm at the kind of the, f- the fledgling portion of that career and by and still while maintaining my my playing career because my playing career i i feel like can go on another 25 years or something well, we, i mean we definitely want to get into talking about the public speaking and <coughs> and i'm fascinated as to you know what you would talk to the the folks at fedex about and, and what experiences you can bring in to help these these big companies as well but before we kind of get there take take us take us kind of back to how you first learned your your craft as a drummer where it all began and at what point you said in your life okay drumming is what i want to do this is this is what i'm going to i'm going to do for a living well it started when i was well It started way, way, way back. I mean, I don't particularly remember this. My mom brought out some pictures before she passed away. And it was, uh, there were pictures of me under the Christmas tree at about three years old playing with this toy drum. And so I guess the seed was planted then or the seed was always there, you know, from birth. Because uh, uh, she, my mom told me that I, uh, um, there was no other toys I was given that Christmas that I paid any attention to. That it was just the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum. And then, so I was around two or three at the at that time. And fast forward when I was fourteen, 
I lived, uh, we, my family moved from Manhattan to Staten Island and, and uh, we were playing softball in the, in the street and the softball was lost. So we went into, I went into my friend's, my friend and I went into his dad's closet to get another softball so we can keep playing. And in his dad's closet was a snare drum. And I said, Freddie, please let, ask your dad if I can borrow that. I, I, my eyes, my eyes opened up wide when I saw that, that snare drum. So I ended up borrowing the snare drum. My mom allowed me to play it. She said, just put a towel over it so it doesn't make that much noise. And I started playing, playing along with records from my mom's and my older sister's rock and roll collection. <clears throat> and then when I had to give the drum back, I was seriously, you know, bummed out and depressed. And she said, my mom said, well, you save your allowance and we'll see how bad you want the drum, drum set. And We'll see, you know, we'll, we'll get you a drum set. And um, so about eight or nine months later, for some reason, it was on New Year's Eve in 1965. Uh, my dad had passed away previously. So my mom and my uncle, we took a trip back into Manhattan at a music store, a mom and pop music store, and we bought a drum set. And I brought the drum set home and set it up and just sat in on a chair and looked at the drum set. I was even cleaning it. I mean, I'm taking a brand new drum set out of the boxes from the factory and I'm cleaning it with, with glass. Clean. I'm clean, cleaning a drum set that's brand new. I was so proud. And I just sat in a chair and I st stared at that drum set and I said, wow, that's the same kind of drum set that Ringo played on Ed Sullivan. I'm going, what, what is it? So I, I just, I, and then from there it was all, um, you know, uh, joining a band and and learning cover songs from the 60s and 70s, all the popular songs that were coming out by British groups. Mainly my, mainly my focus was on the British invasion and the Beatles and the Stones and Dave Clark Five and uh, Hermits Hermits and all, all of the animals and all of, all of the, you know. So that's basically how it started. And then it was cover bands, cover bands, playing other people's material, going on the road and uh, playing in, in bars from 9, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m., uh, six nights a week. And then on our day off, we would travel to the next gig in the Midwest and find the hotel randomly. And when we pulled into town, sharing rooms, the the suitcases were on top of the van. All the equipment was inside the van. It was a really, really low budget kind of thing. But I was got, I got paid a salary and I was on top of the world. We had no roadies, no road manager, no nothing. And that was really my my schooling that six or eight months I was on the road when I first started playing, just playing night after night after night, learning new songs, new songs, new songs. And I didn't know how to read music at that point. It was just, uh, you know, learning by ear, like copying records. And um, there's some pictures on my website that, that, that bear this out. There's the receipt for my first drum set and the picture of my first drum set with the four pictures of the Beatles above it for inspiration. And um, it just goes on and on and on. And then I actually... Uh, let's see. Uh, I was in New York and this was like in the, in the mid seventies and I was still playing cover stuff, but then I, a light bulb went off in my head and I said, I can't be doing this for the rest of my life. And I was in, when I was in college, I actually, because my sister is involved in nuclear medicine, she encouraged me as a little ace in the hole, so to speak, or something to fall back on. She goes, why don't you get your registry in nuclear medicine so you can practice, You then you can go back and play. Once you have that registry and the license, so to speak, to practice nuclear medicine, then you could use it 20 years from now. All you have to do is renew it and maybe take a refresher course or whatever. And she... She was planning on leaving her uh, leaving her job to start a family, and she was going to plug me into her position, which was a very lucrative position. But uh, two weeks or three weeks before I was going to take the test for the registry, I went to x-ray school and nuclear medical school, and two weeks before I was going to uh, take the registry and be done with it. I got this offer to go on the road th that I just spoke about in the Midwest and, and playing, playing all the time. So I spoke to my mom and my sister about it and they encouraged me, oh, stay two more weeks. And I said, mom, I don't want to miss this opportunity and may not come again. 
And she said, okay, if that's the way you really feel in your heart and you believe that you're going to be successful in that endeavor, then I'll go to school with you tomorrow. And this was like a two hour conversation. It wasn't just this cut and dry. Uh, she said, I'll go to school with you the next day and sign you out. So she went with me the next day. She signed me out. I went on the road and I never looked back. So I have to give a lot of credit to my mom for having the faith in, in me and, you know, and, ha and having being open enough to new ideas. And because my mom obviously is old school, you know, so I give a lot of credit for her. To her. I, I don't think without her support and she was a single mom. My dad died when when he was 40 and when I was 11. So I grew up without a father, basically, through my teen years, all those tumultuous years and stuff. But my mom always stayed behind me and whatever. And but she would always make sure that I believed in my heart that I, I could do something or whatever. And, and when I, once I said, Mom, I really, really want to do this. She said she she backed me 100 percent. And subsequently, she used to come to every show that I did within 50 miles uh, of her home. And if she couldn't drive, she would get somebody to drive her. But she was a proud mama on the side of the stage with the laminated pass on. And every every chance she got, everybody that passed her by on the side of the stage, she would point at the drum set and go, that's my son. That's my, that's <laughs> and, I mean, my that, son that, that I mean, with the laminate. You know, she showed a <laughs> let Ma, you don't need to show the laminate to the monitor engineer, Ma. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I but mean, she would she was she was very proud because a lot of parents would, you know, would push their child to say, you know, no, you really need to go to college and do this other thing to have something to fall back on. But the fact that she was willing, she saw that there was a talent in you and she, you know, that she was willing to let you have that freedom to go and do this thing. And because she obviously could see that you believed in that as well. Was there, was there a point, um, uh, when you were doing, you worked with all these great artists. We we just mentioned you know, the Cindy Lopez and the Johnny Winters and the Bo Diddley's and Robin uh, Kids uh, Gibbs. Was there any artist that you remember her kind of going to one of your shows and her really um, her suddenly kind of getting and then thinking, you know, my my boy made the good made a good good choice here. Um, well, she she well it, it, she never actually verbalized it. But you could tell, I mean, especially when I got to the point of playing like huge arenas in my area where where my family lived and they were all able to come and they were aunts and uncles and nieces, nephews. And I had a special section. So it, she never really verbalized it like, like, you know, every once in a while she would write in a card, uh, you know, I'm very proud of you. And. Um, she would, she used to call me her wandering son because I was always on the road and stuff. But she, sometimes she actually wrote her thought like that, her appreciative and her, um, you know, she would acknowledge that I made a good choice by saying she's very proud of what I'm doing. And, but we never actually verbalized, you know, Sandy, you know, I was really, I'm really glad you left, you know, ex, uh, nuclear medical x-ray school and all of that. She was, she never really verbalized it, but she, I knew she was proud and, 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 uh, you, just by, just by the mood at the gigs that she would be at. And, and I, I knew it, I knew it, you know, she, she didn't have to verbalize. I just knew it by, by, uh, her actions. So now you have this kind of second career, well, really third career, actually. I mean, there's, there's the, the performing drummer, the touring drummer, there's the teacher, the drum teacher, I mentioned some of the things, and now you've got the speaker as well. <laughs> So right. the, the you know for example you, you mentioned you're speaking at FedEx so what what can a rock drummer teach the folks at FedEx? Well, you know what what a rock drummer can speak um, to, to 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 you know share with the people of any walk of life, any career. There are certain elements, and you know this as well as I do, that go into being successful or happy. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't care if you, if you flip burgers at McDonald's or you're a quote unquote housewife where you take care of the family, there's ways to be happy. You could be, you could be a very depressed CEO making $12 million a year coming from a very, very, uh, rich family with all of the trappings growing up. You could be 
very depressed. And there's evidence of that in our world of ex- executives uh, uh, committing suicide or whatever. On the other hand, you could be, be born in the ghetto, a min- be a minority and not have a penny to your name and your and your, your mom is working three jobs to support whatever. And you could grow up to be super successful and, uh, and, and, you know, have a lucrative career and climb out of that hole. But there's certain in to me, there's certain common threads that permeate everyone, everyone. And I call it this just five of these common threads. I call it Beats, Sandy's Beats, B-E-A-T-S. And the B stands for believe, the E stands for enthusiasm, the A stands for attitude, the T stands for tenacity, and the S, which probably is the most important one, is to serve. And if we incorporate all of these, in other words, you have to believe in yourself and some you know, synonyms of beliefs are trust, faith, belief in yourself, um, you know, and all the principles that go into a successful life and a happy life and a uh, confidence in yourself, conviction. And I can elaborate on each of these to show examples from my career that it started out, you know, at the table with my mom, uh, leaving the medical career where I believed in myself and I, and maybe I didn't have all the talent that I was going to have or all the talent that I have now. And I'm still not done learning drums. I mean, uh, my drumming career is nowhere. When people think of me going into the speaking career and having done some talks, they think, well, you're not going to play drums anymore. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to continue to play drums till I can't play drums any anymore physically because I enjoy it so much and I will do it for free. I just enjoy playing drums with other people making music. The second one is um, enthusiasm and you have to feel positive. You have to believe in yourself and also have an enthusiastic attitude, um, you know, a, a passion, a fire, a spirit towards what your goal is. And just also know it's not when you reach your, your goal, when, when you reach your goal, you know, a lot of people, when they reach the goal, they go, okay, well now what, you know, and it's, it's, then you improve on whatever your talents are. You never stop learning. That's, that's one of my, my credos is you never stop learning because when you think you know everything about something or someone that's the beginning of the end. You're already you're already at the crest of the mountain. So enthusiasm is very, very important. And you always do your best at all times. You know, you can phone your part in. I was on the road with Cindy Lauper playing the same tunes, basically in the same order. And she was the kind of artist that really frowned upon improvisation. She wanted to songs to sound like the record, which understandably is a good 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 way to go for the audience. And uh, so it became a challenge to me to stay enthusiastic and not to call my part in because if you know Cindy Lauper's music, for example, it's it's basically straight ahead and very simple, rhythmically very simple. The song starts and then the song ends, and the drum part has very little variation in it. And uh, for that reason, you know, after doing 50, 75 shows of playing the same tune the same way, it's easy to kind of drift off as you as you go through your muscle memory thing and just play the tune like you did last night and start thinking about other stuff. And you call your part in. In other words, that's what we call it. But at one of those gigs was Joan Jett and her manager at one of Cindy Lauper's gigs. And five years later, I get a call from her manager going, you know, one of the reasons why we liked you and, and Joan liked you as a drummer is because you played, you played from the heart. You played with enthusiasm. You engaged the audience uh, throwing sticks out and, and all of that. You, you, you looked like you were having a tremendous amount of fun. And that's what Joan wants to bring to her table. So would you want to come and, and audition for the band? Because we need a drummer to do this tour. So that's how, I, and that's, 
you know, you never know, you never know who's watching. So always do what you do with enthusiasm, have fun doing it and feel good about yourself after you've done it. And, you know, and that, one of these ones you mentioned here was tenacity, which is obviously a really important uh, uh, thing to build up as a, as a as a musician or in any any walk of life as well. This just kind of this grit, you know, some people kind of grit tenacity. Um, can you tell us about a time in, in your life when you've worked on a project, you've given it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, the lessons that you, you learned from that experience. Okay, okay. I got a perfect example. There, when, when I was playing all those cover bands and all of that, I did that from, let's say, I don't know, 1968 or something. I, I started playing in bars when I became old enough. And I did that for about, I don't know, seven, eight, ten years, something like that. Or somewhere around 1976, uh, I was advised by a good friend of mine that I grew up with who now had a gig with David Bowie. His name was Earl Slick. He was the guitar player in, in the band. I grew up with him. We, I knew, we, we knew each other before we played instruments. Anyway, he went to L.A. because uh, Bowie was based there at the time. And he said, Sandy, you got to come out here, man. There's a lot of opportunities out here. You could stay at my place while you look for a place. Uh, that at, at the time, it was all punk and, you know, punk uh, uh, music happening and like Ramones and, and all of that stuff. So and a lot of the rock clubs in New York were, were closing. So it seemed like a good time to turn the page. And when I was on my on the plane out out to L.A., I moved to L.A. And when I was on the plane, I promised myself I am not going to play cover material and make a living. I'm going to move to L.A. and go into original material. Even if it's just a tour with an original act, I do not want to get caught in that or get sucked into that trap of making a living playing cover material because it's very easy to do because you got to make the jump. At a certain point, you got to jump off that cover band wagon and go. So you're giving up that income. And you're making a leap of blind faith into another area of your career. And that's what I did. And I said to myself, I'll work a straight job in L.A., but I want to play with an original material band. So I did that. And I did that for three years. And it didn't work out. I made some mistakes. Uh, I auditioned for Rod Stewart when I was out there. And I I made a mistake of, of even though there was drums provided at the audition, I bring like a 12-piece drum set. Uh, to the audition, making the band and Rod wait a good half hour, 40 minutes for me to set up my drums. And Rod made the comment, like, you, these drums better sound good. And the punchline to that little vignette is the fact that the song I had to play for the audition was Tonight's the Night, which is a song, a ballad played with brushes. Oh. And I bring this big, huge drum set. Anyway, that little move to L.A. didn't work out. My relationship was falling apart with my first wife. We, I hardly had money to pay the rent at the end of the month. It was horrible. And I was just about to put it down. I was just I was I had thoughts of throwing the drumsticks in the fire. And, and but the thing that kind of uh, there was a little voice inside me said, no, keep going. Keep going. And I kept asking that voice inside me, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So anyway, I slept on it. And a couple of days went by. I said, don't make an emotional decision. And a couple of days went by. I slept on it. I asked for guidance. And I slept on it and slept on it. And all the while, I kept visualizing myself on a big stage. I kept visualizing myself in a pro recording studio. This is going to work. I felt in my heart that I deserved to have this because I was going to bring something to the table. And right then, one morning, two or three days later, I got up and I, I found myself going to the library to find this. The Billboard magazine puts out this artist management directory. And I sent typewritten one finger at a time on a typewriter. This is 1975. I typed out a resume, which didn't really include any names of note, except one name, Carmine Apice. He was the drummer for Vanilla Fudge and Cactus a long time ago. And I met him in LA through Slick. And I asked him uh, if I can use him as a reference. And he said, sure. So and, and in that conversation, I told him about the this is a little side note. 
I I told him about the the audition, how the audition went, and and I said he's looking, Rod is looking for a drummer. I don't think I got it. And I said, come on, you should go for it. And he went, and he ended up playing with Rod Stewart. He got the gig and ended up playing with Rod Stewart, and he's forever indebted to me about it. He mentions it in interviews all the time. Anyway, so I typed the resume out, and I send the resume to fifty managers that managed bands that I liked their music. One of those managers was Peter Grant of Led Zeppelin. He was based in England, yeah. but his photo, his address that you mail him was his uh, Led Zeppelin's label, which was Swan Song Records at the time, and it was the address was Madison Avenue, New York. I, I didn't get 49, 49 of the resumes went unanswered. One guy called me back and it was the manager. Uh, there was the attorney for Led Zeppelin, Steve Weiss at the time, who ran Swan Song and had Zeppelin's office in New York. It, the resume never got forwarded to Peter Grant. He opened it. And right at the time, he is uh, putting a band together around Michael Bolton and Bruce Kulick, who were writing songs. They had songs, and these songs were being at, right at this moment, at this period, time period. His their songs were being shopped at different labels in New York, and the labels were calling Steve Steve Weiss back, going, "We want to see this band. The songs are awesome." So now he needs to showcase and put a band together around Michael and Bruce, and he doesn't have a drummer and a bass player. Right at this point in time, my resume arrives. Now, normally when you see a resume with no names on it, normally somebody of that stature would toss it in the trash. But he saw Carmine's name on it. And ironically, Steve Weiss, years earlier, used to handle and be the attorney for the Vanilla Fudge. And he knew Carmine personally. He calls Carmine in L.A. and says, who's this guy, Sandy Gennaro? Carmine vouches for me. The next phone call Steve Weiss makes is me in L.A. And I, I was on the phone. I almost lost the call because I thought it was somebody in Los Angeles pulling my leg, <laughs> saying that he was the attorney for Led Zeppelin. And I'm and he the long story short, uh, James, is that he do you want to come to New York? He explained the whole situation. We have la labels interested, but do you want to come to New York and audition. I flew to New York and auditioned. I stayed at my mom's house. I auditioned. And five days later, we were meeting with the executives of Polygram discussing a seven album deal. Um, and then two months after, so we signed to the label. We, I, I flew back to LA looking at a, uh, my signature on a 60 page recording contract. And then uh, two months later, we auditioned. I flew back to New York. We auditioned for uh, Tom Dowd who ended up, he never produces new bands, but he ended up producing our first record at Criteria Studios. And that was the first step. This was maybe four months after I was about to throw the drumsticks in the fireplace. And here I am, a Criteria, making a decent salary for someone, you know, doing his first record, signed to a major label deal. And not only was it signed to to a deal, but it was, you know, just any record deal. It was uh, Polygram's 1979 priority to break this band. It was, it was, so anyway, that, that was the start of it. And then, you know, I, I, I thought my dream was gone. I, I, when, when I hear that story, the, the, you know, the, the, the word I, I think of is, 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 is karma almost. I mean, you gave, you gave Carmen that break as well with the, there you the go. Rod Stewart thing. So it kind of comes around. So even, you know, you're, you're kind of putting good out into the world. And I know that it's, you know, maybe early on uh, for a lot of musicians, it, it's that they're, they're, they're maybe they're, if they're operating from a position of fear, um, it's kind of hard to kind of pass on things if, if they don't necessarily think they might get something personal from it. But because you, you had that generosity of spirit, you said, actually, no, this, I'm going to help Carmen. He's kind of, he, this is, you know, this is what we're, we're in it to do as well. And that kind of came right back round. And, uh, and also, you know, that the karma thing could have, might have worked, but it, it wouldn't have worked if you hadn't had that tenacity there to kind of right. keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. <clears throat> so my, my kind of follow-up question on that is that in that, the, the, the deepest points when you were in LA and you weren't getting the callbacks, you weren't getting the calls, it was really tough. What kept you going? You know, I, I, 
I, I, I don't know if there's a word for what kept me going. I, you know, laying awake at night, uh, you know, part of the thing that kept me going was, was I visualized when I was, you know, in, in that two or three day period when I was like, and I said to myself, don't make any emotional decisions right there is a guidance. I don't know where that guidance comes from. I, I, threw the seeds out there. I threw it out there. I'm thinking before I went to sleep at night, I used to dream in that little twilight area by the time you go to hit the bed and by the time you're out. I, the, in that little twilight time, I, was, I thought and pictured myself on stage with a successful act with a screaming audience in an arena you know, them announcing my name and I heard my name being announced. I heard the audience and I just put it out there. I, I, you know, and then the next morning I would think about the same thing. I would think about me being in a recording studio, state of the art with a red light on recording and a a well-known producer behind, behind the board and me playing with the band and everybody getting along and, in a common goal that working as a team and I pictured all of that and that used to make me feel good just thinking about it and feeling it and and hearing the audience and you know standing up at my drum set and raising my arms and to acknowledgement of my introduction I would it would make me feel good so it was almost something you know to do so you know everybody does stuff to make them feel good and that that took me away from the fact, yeah, okay, getting up now, getting dressed, making my breakfast, I would think, oh, sh- sugar, what am I going to do today to help me get out of this? You know what I mean? And then that's what my inspiration came. Well, go ahead and make one last ditch effort and send the resume out. Send your information out. Let people know that you, who you are, even though there was really nothing to, for them to latch on to in the resume except for Carmine and Steve Weiss's case. But that was the only one person that called me back. But that's all I needed was one. So a lot of and, people would a lot of people would would have obviously given up at that point. They would have said, "It's not working. I'm going to go back. Going to go home, and I'm going to get a job." doing something completely different. I'm going to go back to college. So I'm interested, you know, one, you're a frequent counselor now at um, the rock and roll fantasy camps, which have a lot of people that have, for whatever reason, maybe they don't even get that opportunity when they were younger to make music their thing. And often many of them are kind of coming back and they've reached a point in their lives where they say, you know what, you know what really makes me happy and I enjoy is just playing you know rocking out playing with other 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 people as well so what does that feel like for you now you know at the point you are in your life when you're kind of helping other folks who maybe didn't even get a chance to to make that decision early on it's so gratifying james to be part of a situation like like that because people come to the camp to be in my band sort of and you know some of the people that come to the camp come there because, but they already have careers. I I've had people in my band that were judges, Supreme Court, on the Supreme Court, a judge, uh, a, an assemblyman, a congressman, a, 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 a brain surgeon, uh, all walks of life, very established in their career. But maybe they play, played an instrument in college, or maybe they were a Roger Daltrey fan, and he's going to be at the camp. So some of the campers come because they're fans. Uh, of of the artists that are going to be there and they play a little instrument. So how how big of a kick would it be for you to play my generation with Roger Daltrey singing it? So that's on stage. Uh, you know, it, it is kind of pricey for the campers to do it, but it's kind of like any other fantasy camp. It's like a sports fantasy camp or whatever. You put the baseball uniform on or the rugby uniform on and you kick some balls around with uh, some famous rugby players or whatever and pose for pictures. It's like a big meet and greet, but you actually play instruments, but that's one part of it. But you also get the the people that have, or the kids that are trying to make it and they use the camp as like a networking kind of thing where they want to, they want to be able to say, Hey, uh, I played in a band of Sandy to me. This is a YouTube link of me and Sandy playing whatever. And, I enjoy that because it combines, for me, a camp, I enjoy it because it combines performing, uh, well, first teaching and the gratification of 
they, they come into camp very intimidated and sometimes a little shy about their talent or lack thereof. And I, I disarm them day one by day four, they're playing the song and I'm going, you see, you know, and, and I can go into detail about specific instances where people were, were about to leave the camp because they felt overmatched or, you know, where they're looking, looking for the chords on a guitar, you know, that they're that much of a beginner. So that's the challenge for me trying to find the middle ground in my band where everybody can be happy. But it's very, very gratifying for me to share my knowledge and to share my experience. And again, you can, I can bring a point out where, you know, you want to, you need to kick ass on this, excuse the French, you need to kick butt on this gig, you know, because the finale is all the bands perform all their songs and then as well as play with the headline uh, artist. So I said, do you know where confidence comes from? Confidence comes from work ethic. Confidence comes from when you have to perform a deed or a gig or a task or give a speech or, or perform an operation or, uh, or judge somebody in a murder trial and, and you're, you're the one that determines his future. It's preparation. And preparation breeds confidence and confidence, confidence, you can't, you can't hold the, you know, when somebody sees me play, they say, wow, you play with so much confidence and so much enthusiasm. It's because I come to the table prepared. And, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast about the Dick Wagner Memorial concert. And, and again, it's all for a good cause, but I'm doing it for free. I'm doing it for well, the band does it for free because it's a it's a benefit basically for a foundation he founded before he died that helps underprivileged kids and I was sent 19 songs and some of his material is long and and medleys and eight minute epic songs and there I am downstairs spending and I'm gonna right after I get off the phone with you I'm gonna go downstairs and rehearse some of the songs we're gonna rehearse today or further rehearse. So when people see me at rehearsal, and of course, there's only always one guy in the band that's not c coming prepared, and he's asking for the chords of the keyboard player, the guitar player is asking for the chords of the song, because he don't have time or for whatever reason did not prepare the stuff prior to rehearsal. So everybody goes, oh, Sandy, it sounds awesome. You sound, oh, I'm so stoked to play with you, blah, 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 blah. But they don't know what goes on behind the scenes. I worked, <laughs> I tirelessly shedded that stuff, you know, for hours. And I'm going to go down and rehearse these songs again and in, in to brush off the dust of them because I learned them originally, and, uh, you know, when we started rehearsing a week ago. So now we're doing these particular songs today. So I'll review those songs today. And, and, and is know? That, there's that expression, you know, they, they say, don't compare your back shop to someone else's front shop. Where, right. you know, you know, someone seeing you, you, you get into that rehearsal situation or you're up on stage or you're teaching at that rock and roll fantasy. Album, and and because obviously you make it look so easy, but they don't see all the hours and hours and days and days of you in woodshedding and, and things not working and struggling, trying to work out a particular pattern or a particular part. Right. And, and that's and that that's key. And that's when you see an acrobat on TV doing all this stuff. You know, wow, uh, wow, you know, but but you don't know the the amount of hours that that you know he they they put into doing that. Now, for example, I was asked to come and sit in uh, with a band here in Nashville, and they asked me to do a monkey song because they knew I was involved with the monkeys, and it was a song I played over and over and over and over again when I was with the monkeys. But I haven't been with monkeys since uh, Davey passed away, and. Um, so there I am. It was Pleasant Valley Sunday. I had to play. And I, I, I was downstairs and my daughter, my 21 year old daughter, Jerry, heard me rehearsing Pleasant Valley Sunday. And she goes, Dad, you played that song a million times. Why you got to spend time to rehearse it? I said, Jerry, because I haven't played in a, in, in, in a little while. And it's even if playing the song, it just brushes the dust off it. Now it's in the forefront of my brain instead of a, my, my brain that, that was functioning seven, eight years ago. Yeah. You know, so I brushed the dust off. It was everything was fresh. And then when I go and play that night, 
it rocked. Yeah, it's it's, you know? it's, it's, it's like when if you've got a piano where you know if it's a new piano that comes in, uh, or you've 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 got a piano from somewhere, and the first time someone comes in to tune it, they probably have to tune it maybe once a month or once every couple of weeks, and then after a while, then they only have to tune it once every you know three months, and then once every six months and then once every you know nine months but they still have to keep on tuning it right because if they don't it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's not gonna work exactly right and and it's you know it's all it comes down to james to me life is very simple you want to be the, you know the universe or god or the higher power whatever you want to call it you know, we're all part of the same family, human family. And, you know, and not to get philosophical or spiritual, which I don't have a problem doing, but this is not maybe the forum to get into in depth my beliefs in terms of that. But it, it, it positive, you know, all you need is love. Everything that's good, everything that's successful, everybody that's successful long term is a uh, subscribes to positiveness. It's being in that positive river flow. It's a flow. It's an energy that you have to kind of, and all you have to do is change your thinking or think positive and you become part of that energy. When you start getting bummed out and say, so, oh, I could never do that. You know, in LA, if I would have threw the drumsticks in the fire, that would have put a blockade in that river, that flow. I'm not in that flow anymore. But when you serve, when you open the door for a handicapped person or you throw a drumstick to somebody in a wheelchair in the audience, it makes me not only do, th you know what? Let me finish that thought because I can go on. We can do two hours here, James. Um, <laughs> let me finish that thought. You know, w it makes me feel good when a handicapped person and I see the expression on the face and I always almost get emotional talking about it. It makes me feel good. You know, it might be a selfish little attitude, but making people feel good, make me feel good. When I open the door for somebody or what, and they say, thank you. And there's a big smile. I, I, you know, it makes me feel good. So that puts me in the positive flow, thinking positive about your goals and working tirelessly, you know, towards your goals. And this, I, it's very, very hard to ex explain, but you know, the, the very important one to me is serve. You always serve whether you're a CEO or whether you're a mommy taking care of the children and the husband and keeping the house, you're serving. And when you serve, that's when the karma happens. You can call it karma. You can call it you being in the positive flow of the river. And when that energy takes over, you know, just recently I told you I left the Pat Travers man, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why, but it was a bit of a toxic situation and there were demons floating around in that situation. Let's just leave it at that. And, you know, I have this Whitford St. Holmes thing coming up, but it's not like I was offered a gig with McCartney. I was offered a gig with uh, Kid Rock. So uh, see you later, Pat. No. I left it because of it was a toxic situation and it wasn't good for me to be around it. When you hear the, the expression birds of a feather flock together, well, I was with him. I was with him in the early 80s and he called me back in 2010 and I've been with him for the last five years. And I couldn't this this when I reunited with him, I saw there was some changes in him and I, I, I didn't want to be around it any longer. And then there was one instance that basically broke the, sh bro the straw that broke the camel's back. And it happened in my home of all places. And it's not that this don't work. So I left the band and uh, without anything permanent uh, to go through. But since I made that decision, that leap of faith to better my life and to better my reputation and to, you know, that r the positive river isn't flowing around that gig. And I felt it. And, mm -hmm. and, and, because of actions and words of other people. And uh, I heard it from friends of mine, uh, you know, uh, whatever. That I don't want to go there. But um, I, when, I, when I made that decision, James, I started getting phone calls. I started, hey, are you interested in doing this? 
all of a sudden, when I got back, what I call, I got back in my canoe and I was on that river again without any obstacles, things started to happen. And just in light of that, you talk about now, I've been speaking motivationally uh, for a long, long time, not to corporations, but at the collective, I inaugurated the music business program. So a lot of times there was uh, a group of maybe 50, 75 students there. Um, they invited the public. So yeah, I talked about the music business. When I gave a drum clinic, I talked about how to play certain parts or how to play the drums to certain songs or whatever it was. Uh, but I also you know, inevitably would get questions of how do you get a gig? How do you keep a gig? How do you, when, you know, same questions you ask me when the chips are down, how do you keep going? So there was an element of motivational uh, visualization, belief in yourself, keep going. If you don't make an audition, don't take it personally. You know, there's a lot of auditions that I didn't get for one reason or another, but it may not be because you're a bad person or that you're a crappy drummer. You know, it, they may not like your look the way you look or you don't have platinum blonde spike hair. So, you know, don't don't just believe in yourself. And, you know, there are a lot of actors and musicians that don't get gigs that keep going. And keep going. So, that, and, so and, you, you give you obviously give a lot of advice now to the, the next generation of musicians, musicians as well. But share with us what was the, the best advice that you have ever received about understanding and, and making it in in music, which is not one of the easiest industries to to make in. <clears throat> Be prepared if if even if it's a a, a gig. Uh, that is just be prepared no matter what level the gig is on. If you're asked to, if you're asked to go and play somewhere, I don't care what it is. You prepare the same way. If you're playing at a little pub on a Monday night with three people there at the bar or you're playing Madison square garden, I prepare the same way. Because when I'm behind the drum set or I'm behind a podium, I want people to enjoy it and I want to enjoy it. So that's it. And then the little, the little sub benefits of that is you never know who's watching and uh, it may lead to your five years from then. It may lead. And I, and, and in my talk, I give examples, for example, I was already playing arenas and all of that. And when I was off the road, I was offered uh, a gig with um, uh, the, this band called The Tokens, who had the hit in the 60s called Lion Sleeps Tonight. And it was one of those gigs where they don't have a set band. They just call whoever's available. You're available. They have one musical director who kind of gets the band together for any particular gig. And they don't carry their own band around the country. So a local New York gig... I, the musical director called me, do you want to do this gig? It doesn't pay much. Uh, we're going to send you charts and a CD. And you learn the songs, you come to the gig and uh, do a sound check and, and play. So I did that. Even though it was low money, I had to bring my own drums. And Mr. Arena drummer could have said, nah, I don't want to do that. All right, so I did it anyway. And you know what? I was down in my studio preparing that like I was going to audition for McCartney. I, I, I learned it where, and then when I thought I knew it all, I went down and rehearsed it again. The afternoon of the gig, I rehearsed it again. So I went and I, I, I shined. I, I had a great time. Everybody seemed to be very, very happy. And the drum, uh, the bass player in that band, now I had worked, I did one tour with the Monkees in 1987, and that was uh, that was I got that through another situation. But that's it. So after that summer tour, their first uh, um, reunion tour, uh, things kind of okay. Thank you very much. It was a very successful tour. Blah blah blah. So now from '87, fast forward to '95 when this token gig happens, and I went. And I'm talking, it was very successful. I talked to the bass player who was the Tokens MD at the time. And he said, uh, 
gee, Sandy, what you been doing? What kind of tours you doing? I really like playing with you. Who's the bass player? I really like playing with you, Sandy, blah, blah, blah. And I told him some of my history or whatever. And I said, what do you do, Jerry, when you're not doing the tokens? He goes, well, I'm musical director for the monkeys. I go, oh, well, say hi to Davey, Mickey, and Petey because I was, uh, I was with the Monkees like, oh, you know, eight, nine years ago when they did their first tour, 86, 87. And he goes, oh, I will. I will. Oh, great, Sandy. Great playing with you, man. We exchanged numbers or whatever. Two months later, Sandy, do you want to come out and play with the Monkees again? Because we, the drummer we have now is, is, for one reason or another, is not happening. So I went and did it. I went and did it. And, you know, from 97, James, up until David Jones died, what did he die? Two, two and a half, three years ago? We had every reunion tour they did. I, I went out just because of that meeting, the MD at the Tokens gig. There <laughs> I have one another gig. gig that, yep. And, and that was very lucrative. And it was a ton of fun going out and playing amphitheaters. Every summer almost they went out. And if it was some configuration like, you know, whatever, that, was a, that, that had a lot of legs. You know, the, the gig had a lot of legs. And that's basically... How I got Cindy Lauper's gig as well. Well, that's the preparation, and you never know. Always prepare, and every time you sit behind your instrument or behind the podium or behind your desk, you do the best that you can because you don't know who's going to be on the other end of that phone. You don't know who's going to be in the audience. You don't know who who's going to be in that band that you play with it on that crappy little oldies gig. Coming, with the original time I was with Pat Travers, after a show, it was a really hurried situation where we had to get dressed really fast and get out to the bus because the bus was, we had a, for some reason, it was a big rush getting out of there. It was a very successful show. This is 1981. And I'm leaving, I'm, I'm putting my clothes on, at, you know, put my jacket on as I'm leaving the dressing room, my hair wet and everything. And this guy is at the doorway standing there. And I said, excuse me. He goes, oh, Sandy, I just want to shake your hand a second. That was awesome. Blah, blah, blah. He goes, I'm a bass player. He goes, I, I, I said, I really don't have it. He goes, I'm a bass player. And, and would you hook me up uh, for some gigs in New York as auditions or whatever? I said, you know what? I don't really have the time to talk to you right now. Uh, but here, I can't recommend you if I don't hear you play. So I said, send me a cassette of your playing and I'd be happy to recommend you to the appropriate people. I gave him my card and I said, what is your name? And he said, Dave. I said, Dave, thank you very, very much. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I don't have the time, but I got to go. He said, Sandy, I really appreciate you stop and take a minute and talk to me. I, I'll be in touch. So anyway, fast forward. I, I, we kept in touch. I, I turned him on to some auditions in New York, which he never got. But about two years later, and then he called me every once in a while. How you doing, Sandy? How's the band? Blah, blah, blah. We stayed friends on the phone, basically. He called me three years later and goes, Sandy, I want to send you a tape. I just signed this girl to Epic Records. I'm managing this girl, a new artist. And she's going to be huge, which is something you hear all the time from a new artist. So it's going to be the best big thing. Come down and play for free. But it wasn't one of those things. She go, he goes, let me send you a demo. We want you, we want you in this band. So he sends me the demo. And it was girls just want to have fun time after time. She bop all through the night. And I called him back. And this is, these are songs I never heard of. But I thought they were good, catchy little pop songs. So I said, David... I can recommend you uh, to a couple of other drummers, but I don't think I'm right for this. I'm coming off the Pat Travers band, by the way, with, you know, double bass drum set. And this is like girls just want to have fun. I'm going, well, it may be a little light for me. So he goes, Sandy, it ain't. We want your backbeat, man. We want your backbeat. I was telling her about you, the way you play, and we want that backbeat. Come down and meet her. And uh, and then you can make your decision, but don't make any any decisions too soon. So I said, OK, I went down to the studio where there was still kind of putting overdubs on that first record. I met her and she goes, you know, Sandy, why don't you go in and play? There's a drum machine bass drum on this song. And uh, why don't you go in and play this? This, You know, when you hit the sign of the stick on the rim of the snare, and the clicking sound, I wanted to I wanted to sound like a clock. Because there's a line in the song, and the clock ticks, and I think of you. So I, I didn't really know what she meant. So she left the room uh, temporarily, and the producer said, I think she just wants the, the side stick on the snare on two, three, and four of the measure. I said, okay. 
So I went in. She go. He goes. Don't play the bass drum. Don't play the hi hat. Just play the side stick because you're going to play along with the drum machine. I said sure. So I went in and did it, and it, it just so happened it was time after time. Mm -hmm. So after that, and playing, it's playing that song over and over again. Playing, you know, doing the overdub, hearing, hearing, the, and hearing it played back. I went, man, this is an awesome song. <laughs> so this is a freaking awesome song. I'm singing it on the way home or whatever. So I called David the next day and I said, I want to be in this band. I think I think she's got I think the song you can't hold these songs down. I said, you know, with the right promotion and, you know, letting people know that these songs exist, it's going to be skyrocket. So that's what I felt. And anyway, so that's what happened. But if, the point is, James, that if I turned him away, you know, three years earlier at the doorway when I was in a Mr. Hotshot drummer. And this is a guy that looked like he stepped out of Woodstock. He had long hair with a beard, kind of disheveled looking. If I could have, if I blew him off, I would have never got Cindy no, Lauper's gig. Number two, during Cindy Lauper's gig, um, Charlotte Coliseum in the middle of that tour, I meet someone who is to become my wife, and we're married 25 years and have a 21 year old girl uh, majoring in the music business at Belmont University here. So it's like, where would my life be if I took the fork, and the right fork in the road instead of the left one? Absolutely. Well, Sandy, it's been great having you on the show and, and telling you about your experiences and your, your creative life as it's, as it's gone, your creative journey as well. Share, finally, share the best ways that listeners can connect with you and learn more about what's going on in your world, what, what shows you've got happening. Okay, well, I'm, I, I'm my, you can search me on Facebook and, you know, G-E-N-N-A-R-O, Sandy is the first name with a Y, and search me on Facebook. Um, SandyGennaro.com is my website, and I'm still building my LinkedIn page, but they can always message me on Facebook, and I make a point when I get an email from someone, a private person, I always personally answer it. So I would love to hear from any listener you have. And uh, if I can share any of my advice um, or any of my experiences, um, I, I would love to. I would welcome that opportunity. Awesome. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for coming on the show. I wish you best in all the, the new touring you've got coming up and this, this big charity event you've got uh, happening soon as well. And uh, look forward to catching you play live sometime. I appreciate it, James. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I do appreciate it. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.